So I wanted to jump on here and do a quick video. I don't know how quick it'll be, to be honest. Um, I just have to breathe. I just want to have a very frank and candid conversation. Um, you know, a lot of times I make these videos for my friends, pe Facebook friends, people like that. But I obviously it's on YouTube so anybody can see it. So very quickly, I have a long background in politics from my parents being elected officials, both of them, uh, to social justice campaigns, to local, you know, all the way up to presidential campaigns, from organizing to fundraising, all these things, you know, worked on the Obama campaign, um, knew of Obama when he was a state senator back in Chicago, etc. All that to say, I really want to have a very frank conversation and ask people and I asked this on my Facebook group. How serious are you about Trump being a one-term president? Of course, a lot of people quickly say, of course, yes. What are you talking about, of course? But what I'm seeing, um, not just within my circle of friends and things, but, you know, outer, I, the way people are acting um, and, the, and the things they're choosing to focus on, and where they're choosing to put their time, it does not seem like some of the, some of you all want Trump to be a one-term president. So, like I said, I'm I'm really speaking to my you know circle of friends. Um, many of the people I know, many of you are very active in politics, just like I you know I am and have been. And a lot of us have been on the same path together, you know, organizing you know around various issues and doing the work and everything. But I feel like some of you are getting terribly distracted and I feel like some of you are supporting candidates that you know cannot win. I feel like some of you are just watching MSNBC, listening to everything they're saying or listening to these media outlets, which we know are businesses, no matter what political viewpoint, and these same networks, this is why we have Trump now, you know, one of the reasons. So I feel like some of you are waiting and waiting to like just go with whatever they're saying or you're waiting for Iowa, which is 90% white and does not look like the Democratic Party, waiting for them to tell you what to think. And if you don't fit into in, any of those groups, fine. It doesn't apply to you then. Trump is already running a general election against Joe Biden. He's already running this election. Many people were begging Joe Biden to run in 2016. Then after Trump won, which he, yeah, Hillary got the three million, blah, blah, blah. The, the rules are who wins the electoral college? Trump won. He won the electoral college. Popular, that does not matter. That's not, or, you know, it matters, but it's not the rules. Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. So Trump won. <laughs> then many of you were begging and hoping that Joe Biden would run in 2020. So then he came out, or he was getting ready to come out, before he even launched his campaign, now we know that Trump was already trying to get oppo research, opposition research, okay? He was trying to get opposition research on Biden, was trying to manufacture a story, contacted Ukraine, sent Rudy, you know, all, all of that stuff happened because he knew that Joe Biden is his biggest threat. Why? Because he's got the name recognition, he's familiar, he's experienced, he has connected, he's got the relationships, he's connected to Barack Obama, one of the most popular presidents, you know, in the history of our country. He has the coalitions, African Americans, and um, non-college educated people, mostly non-college educated whites. Biden has both of those groups, just as Obama did, just as Bill Clinton did. They know the numbers. So all of these reasons, you know, plus Trump's, you know, not being popular and everything, and Joe Biden having, you know, I mean, he got the, the freedom necklace or freedom medal or whatever from Barack Obama. You know, Trump knows that Biden is his biggest threat. So now we know this past summer, all that happened because they were, they were or, or maybe last year, whenever it happened, I, you know, not keeping track of all the impeachment stuff. But what I'm saying is they knew that Biden was the biggest threat. The media, they want a second term of Trump. I am absolutely convinced of that because they are mischaracterizing things that are happening on the ground. 
Specifically, I've seen it with MSNBC. And, and that can look like all kinds of ways. I'll talk about that later. I've done YouTubes on that, but I'll talk even a little bit about that later. But what I'm saying to you is, even before Biden announced, people wanted Biden and he was already polling at the top before he ever announced. Before he even announced, all these hit pieces and smears and these things started coming out. Then once he hopped into the race, more hit pieces, more smears and all these things come, you know, started coming out. <coughs> so I don't know who is going to be the nominee. I don't know who can beat Trump because it's going to be hard no matter what to take on Trump, just like it would be difficult to take on any incumbent president. But what I do know is when you look at certain factors and certain things, Biden is in one of the strongest position, if not the strongest. I believe it's the strongest, but I'll even leave, you know, a little wiggle room. But I believe he is the strongest to take on Trump for a variety of reasons. And I can get to that later, which is one of the reasons I'm here. If you are, I didn't anticipate, I was going, I knew I was going to be involved in this, you know, election because I didn't do anything in 2016. And that is the biggest regret I have. I just thought Hillary like, oh yeah, they got it, you know, and everything. I regret that to this day. Um, I underestimated Trump, and I regret that to this day. <laughs> and I have been interacting in situations with the media, specifically MSNBC, and interacting with black Republicans um, here in the South. And what I'm seeing, again, it is going to be difficult no matter what, but it's, it's doable to beat Trump. Um, but we have to be organized. And we have to be on the same page as best we can. And it starts right now. I, I, I can't even, I have to even get into a whole other video or talk later about the voter suppression issues that are happening because I'm very connected into what's going on with that. And when I say very connected, I mean people I know who are in lawsuits with the state of Georgia um, through Stacey Abrams' fair fight action regarding it. So what I'm trying, I'm like shaking because of what I'm trying to say is those people, th those of you out there, if you're for another candidate, fine, whatever. I'm not talking to you. Well, sort of, I am. If you're for another candidate that you know is probably not going to win, I've heard people say this. Oh, they want out. They want Trump out so bad. They are obsessed with this man. They post about him. You know, they've been posting about him. You know, for years now, every day, and saying all these things about Trump. And they'll say to me, "Oh, I'm going to support you know Andrew Yang, for example." I'm going to support Andrew Yang or Marianne Williamson. Or, they're not, not literally these people, but other people. And I get to that in a second. But I'm probably going to, I'll vote for Biden in the general. That doesn't make sense. You need to be voting for the person who is the best equipped to take on Donald Trump in the general. You need to vote for them now in the primary. And you need to be working and doing whatever you can to support that candidate and make sure that candidate is nominated and goes in strong into a general. It does not make any sense because this race is going to be close. There's so many people in it. It does not matter who wins the state. It matters who wins the delegates. So it's it's going to be a very close race with these delegates. And if you're thinking like this, guaranteed somebody else is thinking like this too. Oh, I, I know, you know, Julian Castro can't win, but I'm just going to go ahead and support him. And then I'll, I'll then assuming, and then I'll, I'll support Biden in the, you know, general or something like that. <coughs> you might do that and end up at the end when the delegates are all lined up, we might have a candidate who is very weak that cannot win. Trump was not looking for opposition on a South Bend mayor. He was not looking for opposition on Bernie Sanders because he already knows he can probably beat Bernie Sanders because Americans, many Americans are not for ideas and policies around socialism or anything that smells of socialism or anything else. No matter how you want to cut it and everything, that socialism is going to be used. They're already using it. I'm seeing YouTube um, ads here in Georgia because it depends on what state you're in, what kind of commercials you're getting, what kind of information. It's different in every state what's happening. Georgia is going to be a contested state. And I'm already seeing these ads coming up and they're saying, do you agree with left policies? Do you agree with socialism? And there is some truth to that because I am not a Bernie Sanders supporter. I don't believe in a lot of his policies. 
and I don't believe in his approach. And if I'm feeling like that, there are definitely other less informed people who might see a commercial or something or, or, or keep hearing and, you know, the old Carl Rove saying or whoever said it, you lie, you tell a lie enough, people are going to believe it and believe it's true. We can debate the merits of that at another time. This is my opinion based on experiences and everything else with campaigns and everything else. Another issue, and, and the thing about this, Biden, yeah, his candidacy and his campaign has weaknesses, as, as do all, all the candidates. Trump, everybody has weaknesses, and everybody has strengths. And again, we can debate those merits later. I'm just going to share with you, for those of you who are on the fence about Biden or who know you're going to support Biden, but you want to like play around and date these other candidates or something, I'm here to try to appeal to you to get involved now and put your support behind him now, especially if the candidates that you are supporting or the policies that they're putting out that you doubt or have questions about or you don't believe it, it's going to play in certain states. This election is going to come down not to California. This election is going to come down to Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, first tier, North Carolina, Georgia, um, second tier, and it's really going to come down to those um, five to seven states. These Midwest states over here, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and uh, Wisconsin, those three states, uh, it's going to come down to them. But if we're able to win in Georgia, which we, Georgia is blue. That election was stolen from Stacey Abrams, and that could be a whole other video. Georgia is blue. If we are able to crack the Southern strategy of the Republicans, because that's the only way they've been able to maintain control and power for, for decades. If we can crack the, the Southern strategy and win one or two Southern states, which we absolutely can if we get organized and focused now, that means we don't have to win as, it, it won't have, not, not that we don't have to win, but it won't be so tight on these three states in the Midwest. It gives us some wiggle room. It's called expanding the map. So who has expanded the map? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, when he ran in 90, 92 or 96, he won Georgia, he won Louisiana, he won Arkansas. When Barack Obama, and he won the Electoral College of the Popular. When Barack Obama ran, ran um, he won Florida, he won uh, North Carolina, um, and he was very close in Georgia. So was Hillary Clinton. So what I'm saying is, if we're able to win here in Georgia, let's say, we only have to win like two Midwestern states. We don't have to win, you know, three, four more. Like we only have to win maybe two, two Midwestern states if we can get Georgia. If we can get Florida, it's over for the GOP because they, have, they need, we don't need Florida. The GOP needs Florida to be able to compete. So if we can get Florida, um, that's a great thing. Or North Carolina, It'll just give us some wiggle room with the electoral map. We have to expand the map. We can't just be caught up in these three Midwestern states, you know, and then there's opportunities in Arizona and every state and every organizing and every situation is different. Everything culturally is different. So what I'm trying to say, I've always, I mean, I've, I, I've always had good, you know, feelings about Joe Biden for a variety of reasons. That can be another um, video. Uh, but what I do want to say right now, or maybe I'll talk about it, is that one of the core issues is Medicare for all. Medicare for all. You saw how long it took to get any kind of, any kind of reform, whether or not it was what you wanted, any kind of reform on health care. It took decades to get from Ted Ken Senator Ted Kennedy to Hillary Clinton with the chip, you know, the children's health insurance, you know, when she was first lady and she was really trying to push that to Obamacare Affordable Care Act. It was so hard to get the, the Affordable Care Act. And that was another initiative I worked on for Barack Obama organizing around um, after the campaign. <coughs> now we have it. Millions of people are covered. Yes, some are like a millions are there are millions that are still not covered, but there are millions of people who have been covered. I was covered, you know, with with it with the Affordable Care Act. So what I'm trying to say to you, it is very difficult to go in and talk about Medicare for all and how you want to change the entire private health care sector 
and, and change the healthcare industry, which accounts for 20% of our economy. And you're going to tell millions of people that they have to give up their private health insurance or, you know, something about their health insurance might be uncertain. That is a hard sell. My mother, I, I really just found it out when I started talking to her. She does not want to give up her private health insurance. She is like, do not touch my private health insurance. I even went in one time and I was like, so what do you think about, you know, not even really like realizing how passionate she was about it. And she's just like, hey, you know, I was like, yeah, so if they phase it in and then, you know, we have a single pair or Medicare for all. And then you, and then maybe in a few years, you got to give up your health insurance. And she's like, no, I do not want to give up my private health insurance. People can do what they want, but I want to keep my private health insurance. And that is because she has had good experiences with the coverage and everything she has. And she just, that's just her choice. So there's people out there who are Democrats and who feel like that. Then you have this other situation. Elizabeth Warren has admitted this, and I believe Bernie possibly has too. There are going to be millions of jobs that are connected to the private health insurance and then maybe spins off into other things um, that are going to be impact, that could be impacted by a switch over to Medicare for all. The, a lot of these jobs, when you start researching and reading these articles, and I understand, we, I agree, we need to change our healthcare system. I absolutely agree. But I don't think we need to do it right this second because we got to take care of Trump. We got to get him out of there first. And we got to get, get as many um, senators uh, and, and keep our Congress people. Like my Congresswoman, Lisa McBath, she's at risk. Um, we're, I'm going to live in a swing district in, um, outside, or like it's between Atlanta and the suburbs. She's in trouble, you know, as far, not in trouble, but yeah, they're targeting her. The NRA is targeting her, had been targeting her candidacy since the day after she won. Congressman um, Doug Jones in Alabama, his seat is at risk. Um, if you look at all these people who won in 2018, a lot of them were not running on Medicare for all. They were, they were running on protecting and building on, a, on a fair, Affordable Care Act. And you can get into all this about moderates and progressives and all this stuff. I'm just telling you the facts. So what I'm going to say is that there research, there are millions of jobs, at least one to two million jobs off top that are going to be with this Medicare for all phase out, they're at risk. And a lot of these jobs are located in the battleground states, in the Midwest. They're located in Ohio, in um, Cleveland. You know, they're located in Minnesota. You know, think about the Mayo Clinic. You know, think about all these things that are in these states. So in Ohio, in Minnesota, um, in Pennsylvania, so you mean it to tell me that you're going to tell these people in, like, first of all, on one side, you mean to tell me the Democrats and, and Bernie, because he's not really a, a true Democrat, <clears throat> you're going to tell me that they're going to sell this, this Medicare for all in these Midwestern towns and places, you know, in these states where people have already, there's already been a hit on the, like the auto industry, the railroad industry, the, um, you know, just a lot of those manufacturing jobs in the Midwest. So a lot of these towns already took that hit. And then now you're going to remove the private healthcare industry that might provide hundreds and thousands of jobs for people. That is a tough sell. And if you looked at these polls, Biden was polling the best um, in some of these battleground states to these other people. I'm just being straight up. Look into it yourself. That is a tough sell. Then you have the idea about Pete Buttigieg. <sighs> my father, my late father, he was a two-time mayor of a suburb of Chicago, as well as you know serving in other... Um, offices and building commissions and, and various things. Pete Buttigieg, when, when he ran for mayor, he, I think, won with like 8,000, 11,000 votes total out of a city that has 100,000 people. So if you're winning only eight to 11,000 votes out of 100,000 people in that city, that says a lot. Now you're expecting this man to turn out 66 million votes and he and he's turned out 88 to 11,000 and he's a mayor of a city of 100,000 people and then now he's going to be the mayor of like uh, like hundreds of millions or be the president of hundreds of millions of people up against an incumbent president like Trump that doesn't make any sense second as i said my father late father late father two-term mayor 
all this experience, military, everything else, I highly doubt he could run for president and be taken seriously, especially against an incumbent president. Pete has a lot of money behind him. You got to understand, he, he's got consultants behind him. A lot of these people are running knowing that they cannot win, similar to, or, well, I'll say this, there, some people run to get their name out there, to get recognition, to fundraise so they can keep money in their coffers, you know, for future and to gain power and, you know, build a bargain and things like that. But what I see with Pete, I just really wonder, I feel like some people are working for him um, because there's a lot of money behind it and they're trying to craft him into this Barack Obama, which he, nobody is Barack Obama. And I feel like it could be a situation where this del these delegates shake out and we mess around and then next, you know, Pete is the nominee. And maybe he wasn't really intending to really try to be the nominee. Maybe he's just intending to try to get his name out there to do something later. <laughs> Similar to Trump. They said Trump did not really run to be president. He was running to, you know, elevate his status and, and you know, this and that. And then he ended up winning. Taking things too far. Um... I also know that Pete Buttigieg, he is having a rough time as Warren is and Bernie, even though they have more support than Pete. But Pete, he is not doing well with black voters. Black voters are the backbone of the Democratic Party. We're 20 to 25 percent of the Democratic Party. If Pete is struggling in a primary with black voters who are Democrats, what is going to happen in a general election? He is not, I mean, it does not translate. If It's a red flag. It is a huge red flag. If Kamala Harris was having issues connecting with black voters, if Cory Booker is having issues connecting to black voters, if Julian Castro is having issues to connecting with black voters, for whatever reason, the numbers are not going. That is a red flag. And that means they're not, if they can't do well in a prime primary they're not going to do well in a general. Let's talk about Republicans. All Republicans are not bad people. All Republican policies are not bad. And I'm not talking about like Mitch McConnell, crazy, conservative, Tea Party, Lindsey Graham. I'm not talking about those crazies. But there are Republicans who are in office, Congress people or whatever, who are kind of like forced to go with what the party wants them to do because if they don't, <laughs> that's their job and that's their position. And yeah, it could be cowardly or scary or whatever or whatever else for them. But the point is, um, Republican voters, they're not all bad people. And they share some of the same values that we do. And many of them don't want to see Trump to be president either. However, because they have different values and maybe because we differ on some issues, there are some candidates more than others where they either don't trust them, have the confidence in them, or they don't, they fundamentally, fundamentally don't agree in their policies. Now, if I'm having an issue with Bernie Sanders and something with Elizabeth Warren, like what they're talking about, just fundamental differences and, and, and fundamental issues with their approach, and, and, and to me, it's showing through their, some of their campaign, what are these um, independent and Republican voters going to do or, be, or think as well? Like, for instance, a Republican is not going to vote for Sanders if they, you know, if, if they believe what Sanders is doing is socialism. So these are real questions that people need to start asking themselves. Because if you want Trump to be a one-term president, we need to talk. And I offer you to contact me via Facebook if you have questions, um, if you want to talk things out. Um, I also want to invite people, now not to debate, back and forth about these other candidates or the issues. But if you're leaning Biden or you want or you would support Biden in general and you know he's probably the best take on Trump, but you're, you know, just into this other person right now or you want to let's talk about that because there's a way that you can support Biden and then offer a little support to somebody else. It doesn't have to be a a, a you know um all or nothing. I like Amy Klobuchar for a lot of reasons. I donate to her um you know, to be on the debate stage <laughs> because she represents some of the things that I support. And I like the way, I think she's very smart and I like the way she handles things. And I like that she owns her prosecutor, prosecutorial record and where she went wrong and made mistakes and everything else. And I'm going to tell you, I have seen all of these candidates in person um, twice in the last um, month or two. 
and I've interacted, you know, with some of them and everything, particularly Vice President Biden and his team and everything else. So if you want to talk to me, I am happy to you shoot me a message on Facebook or you can email spiritpathpodcast at gmail.com and we can, you know, set up a time to talk or whatever. If you are for Biden or if you're just like, look, all these candidates, I don't, I'm not really that in, into or whatever, or I know this person probably can't win, you know, let's talk and let's get you plugged in on what you can start doing now to support Joe Biden, to me, the strongest candidate right now. Um, and of course, things change and everything else. But as of right now, and the way it's looking, and when I look at the history and, you know, running for president is very grueling and, you know, it's it's not like anything people have done. And when I look at his team and the people who are supporting him, when I look at his strategy, when I look at his messaging, messaging, when I know, when I look at him and the fact that he's had a 30 plus year career and has run all these campaigns and he can pol politic and he knows how to get out there and where to go. And, and when I see his fight, um, I know that he can handle this up against Trump. The media is spinning this. I've been talking about this for several months now. The media, and, and if you're just tuning in now, go look at my old uh, YouTube you know, videos. The media is spinning this. It is much more exciting to have a Trump presidency where he's going to be crazy and where he's going to break laws and he's going to do this and that. It's drama. It's chaos. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's entertainment. Because when he does something crazy, then, then the Democrats, you know, they respond and they're outraged and, you know, and then all of this and, <clears throat> excuse me, people can write books and people can pontificate and Trump and this and that. That's money. That's the network. That's ratings. You know, like that is, that is their business. <laughs> so, and then also when you look at how they're covering things, they are mischaracterizing things. They, and I, I mean, and it's not just about one candidate per se. The fact that they're mischaracterizing, like why are they ignore? Like a lot of times they'll ignore Bernie, you know, or they'll ignore Yang, or they'll extra push Warren or extra push Pete or extra push Harris, you know, or they'll ignore Booker, and then next thing you know, they want to pull Booker in and and you know, and feature him, or they'll, you know, paint Biden all kind of crazy ways, like. You know, um, I mean, I don't want to keep repeating, but like, but yeah, like they'll paint Biden like something crazy, like, oh, he doesn't have the stamina or energy or this, this and that. Well, this will be happening. And the next thing you know, there's like all these things happening on the ground. And people have been talking about this on Twitter, on Facebook. They've been talking about how the media is against Biden in many ways and they're not covering his events. They're not covering, um, they keep trying to focus on just black voters. Black voters love Biden only because of this, only because of that. And it's really terribly insulting to be honest. Um, because there's many reasons. Like if I, if this was a job interview anywhere else in the country in the world, Biden would have a job. <laughs> Maybe even Bernie would have a job, you know, or if you're looking for a new face, fresh talent or to diversify, you know, then some of the younger or, um, you know, fresher, senators would have the job or Amy would have the job. I don't think Pete would have the job. I think somebody would look at his resume like, well, we'll smart, you know, maybe we'll keep this over here, you know, a little bit more experience, but I'm probably going to go with the person who, um, he, I mean, was assistant manager for this manager position versus the, you know, person who's, this is his first retail job. Anyway, so the media, and when I say mischaracterizing, like for instance, there's like, all kind of polls that are out, they're taken every week. You know, it can be 50 some polls. The one poll that'll come out that shows, you know, a little tick, you know, of, let's say, for instance, like Pete, like there's all these polls that are out where Biden is strong. The one poll that comes out where Pete, you know, uh, has a little bit of a surge or something like in one poll, the media will stay on that poll for weeks and weeks. And what ends up happening, they'll be Pete surging, Pete, sur Pete, Pete might have searched two points in this one poll. They start saying that and it starts becoming self, um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, and then next thing you know, Peter, people are like, oh, should I be voting for Pete? Because I think he's surging, you know, or same thing with Biden. They'll be saying, oh, you know, Biden, oh, Biden dropped or, you know, like in Iowa or something, you know, but when you look at the, the um, average of the polls, because I like literally look every day and every week and everything, and I track these things or whatever. And listen to these podcasts that you know different pollers um, you know do or whatever. Uh, 
they might say like, yeah, Pete's surging. And then, it, and then in the difference of the error, like the, the three to five point error, it really is like a four way tie, you know, or they'll say, oh, wow, look at the, what's with Warren, you know, she had 10,000 people show up. And then you look and it's a state that's like predominantly white. When you know the Democratic nominee needs black voters. But then when you look at black voters, you know, supporting Biden, they'll stay on that story. But what they're not telling you is that there's a lot of women who support Biden. There are young people. He may not have as many young people as some of the other candidates. He has, but he does have some young people too. Um, and he definitely is doing well with non-college educated white voters. And the black voters and the non-college educated white voters, those were the voters who either lived in states or those were the the groups where Russians targeted them with misinformation. Also, Hillary did not do as well with those two groups. They underperformed. So again, I'm going to share this video. I'll probably do another one pretty soon. But people have got to start getting real with themselves and asking themselves these real, ask yourself this real question. How serious are you about making Trump a one-term president? And if you are serious, you need to look at who you're looking at as your candidate. And if you have doubts, skepticism, because a lot of you all are talking about you, you are for these other candidates, like people that I know who are politically active and everything. A lot of you are talking about you are for these other candidates. I have not seen you go to a candidate event. I have not seen you volunteer for them. I don't even really see a lot of you posting um, a lot showing that you're for this person. It's like a lot of you are just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm for this person. And then you want to just talk about Biden or how Biden's not going to do this. or how, But you won't stand strong with your candidate. If that is you, that's a red flag. It's, it's, your, it's your intuition. Like you're, it's something is holding you back. Something is not allowing you to be all in because you, you know, and if you want to talk yourself into this, you know, or something, or you want to believe a, a me media networks that have already given you Trump last time, that's on you and that's your choice. And maybe, I mean, maybe it'll work out for you. I don't, or, you know, I have no idea. But um, if you're on the fence with Biden or you support him, we need to talk because I need to get you guys, I need to get you plugged into something. What, you know, I'll meet you wherever you are at and we need to get you plugged in somehow because it starts now. It absolutely starts now. Republicans are already running a general campaign. They're already running a general campaign on Joe Biden. They're already doing the voter suppression. They're already working on their misinformation. And, you know, I think the Dems are so traumatized by this Trump presidency that they are like, you know, they're searching and they're confused and they're all over the place. Some, some, not everybody. So again, if you're not resonating with this at all, this is not for you. It's not about you. Don't waste your time. You don't have to email me or leave comments or whatever else. This is just not for you. That's fine. Go with your, you know, but if this is resonating anything I said and you're feeling like, then this is for you. This is, this is my, my offering to you because I've been waiting for this moment since Donald Trump was elected. And as Barack Obama says, the beauty of democracy is you, in four more years, you can vote that person out. So I've been waiting for this moment. Now it's here. I was waiting for the midterms first. And then after the midterms, I was waiting for 2020. And now it's here. And now I am a joyful warrior, <laughs> ready to get this man packing, sending him out and putting this nightmare behind us and then moving forward and then looking at whatever we want to do to um, bring progress and more progress and change to our country. So namaste. Have a good day. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. I don't think Hanukkah is. No, I don't know if it's past or not. Sorry if it has or but um, happy Kwanzaa. Um, am I missing anything? If I am just happy new year and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Peace.